considering the time human beings have been on this planet, it should be no surprise that the dead are hidden everywhere. Below our feet, in our rivers and lakes, at the bottom of our oceans, and in the mountains above us. In many cases we will never see what, if anything, remains of these people, but on occasion the forces of nature have intervened and exposed human relics of the past. Hurricane Agnes struck the United States in June of 1972. After making landfall in Florida on June the 19th, it then moved north, through South and North Carolina, and then east over the Atlantic Ocean. It then headed northwest, making landfall again in New York City, before moving west towards Pennsylvania. This is where most of the damage was caused since the hurricane's arrival on US shores. It brought with it torrential rain unlike any the region had seen in recorded history, and two of the worst hit urban areas were the Wyoming towns of Wilkes-Barre and Forty Fort. The effects on this area were worsened by the bursting of the Susquehanna riverbanks, a river that runs alongside the two towns. This is Forty Fort Cemetery. It was founded in 1869, and in 1972 held more than 6,000 bodies. Because the cemetery is situated immediately west of the river, it was hit hard. Between June the 23rd and 24th, waters rose to record heights, finally bursting through a dike and decimating the cemetery grounds, unearthing coffins and flooding vaults. It's been said that the coffins were seen bobbing in the water as they were carried out of the cemetery and into the streets of Forty Fort. Town resident and former caretaker at the cemetery, John Novak, told the New York Times in 1972, I saw a wave 8 to 10 feet high come across the flats, and on it coffins bobbed like surfboards. Very few people drowned, as most of the townspeople fled their homes to higher ground once they had received warning of the impending flood, but when they were allowed to return two weeks later to begin their salvage operations, they saw coffins and body parts lining the streets, jammed in their doorways and atop their houses. One particularly horrific discovery was described in the Cemetery Traveller blog by Ed Snyder. He described a visit to the Forty Fort Cemetery in 1972, soon after the waters had receded. He wrote in his 2010 blog entitled Cemetery Flood, that after crawling under the eight-foot sheets of plywood, which now lined the cemetery as a deterrent against the curious, he found himself reading from the stench that greeted him on the other side. As he stepped over what was now an expanse of dry mud, he walked past a coffin propped against a tree. As he passed it, he was horrified to see a decomposing corpse still lying in the coffin. A woman in a black gown, with two hunting arrows protruding from her chest, because an earlier visitor to the cemetery had used her for target practice. In 1973, work began to repair the affected area of the cemetery. But after two years of trying to stick to the original pre-flood burial plans, it was decided that the job was too great and the damage to the area was irreparable. Instead, a memorial park was built over the affected area. Of the 2,700 graves that were washed away, 1,410 were recovered and eventually reinterred at the Memorial Shrine Cemetery, seven miles north of Forty Fort. The world's highest mountains are notorious for claiming the lives of mountaineers, many of them having remained frozen in time for decades. Probably the most famous of all are the various bodies still clad in mountaineering attire that scatter Mount Everest and now act as macabre landmarks to current expeditions. But there was a case in Mexico in 2015 that still have the public, the press and historians scratching their heads. Pico de Orizaba is the highest mountain in Mexico and stands at approximately 18,490 feet. In June of 2015, at an elevation of 16,900 feet and on the northern face of the mountain, 
the body of a frozen man, wearing nothing more than a black cashmere suit and a blue shirt, was found. His attire led authorities to believe that he was either an inexperienced climber or, more likely, due to the elevation at which he was found, the victim of a plane crash, which happened back in 1999. Forensic testing confirmed he was around 50 years of age, had died little more than 15 years prior, and probably bled to death. Rising temperatures on the mountain, slowly melting the ice and revealing bare rock, have been cited as the reason for the body's exposure. The unnamed man is currently on display in a museum in the city of Ciudad Sudan. This find came only two months after a local media frenzy was triggered when the bodies of two climbers from the central city of Puebla were found close to the top of the mountain by 12 local civil protection mountaineers. The mummified remains found in June of 2015 are believed to be members of a party of seven who were struck by an avalanche in November of 1959. A surviving member of the ill-fated 1959 expedition, Louis Espinosa, who was in his 70s at the time of the discovery, backed up this theory by saying the high cheekbones on the body photographed look similar to those of his friend Enrique Garcia, who was lost to the avalanche. As far as I can see, there is no update regarding their identities, or the identity of the mystery man found two months prior. This is Lake Granbury in Hood County, North Texas. Back in 1979, this apparently peaceful location was the scene of a violent altercation between 45-year-old Helen Holliday and her husband Herman. On September 29th, the couple were seen by neighbours arguing beside their motorhome, which was their weekend residence, parked close to the bay. Soon after this, Helen was declared missing. Their home in Fort Worth was investigated, but there was no sign of Helen and no clues. Herman Holliday told police that after they had argued, Helen had left in a hurry, driving away in a Chevy pickup towards the town of Granbury. Three days after the scenes at Lake Granbury, Herman Holliday made a phone call to Helen's daughter Karen, who was his stepdaughter, asking if she had spent any time with her mother in the last few days. Whether this was a genuine act of concern, or simply an attempt to divert suspicion away from himself is unknown. But due to the witness statements, and his already well-known violent nature, Herman Holliday was suspected to have been involved in Helen's disappearance. But without any clues at all, no charges were brought against him. After years of airboat and dive searches, the lake yielded nothing, and Helen was eventually declared dead in 1986. The following year, Herman Holliday passed away, either not knowing or taking with him any information. In 2014, Texas was hit with a long drought. The soaring temperatures had brought down the water level of Lake Granbury considerably. On Thursday, April 17, 2014, at 11am, a city worker noticed the back portion of what looked like a car protruding from what was now shallow water a few feet from the shore, close to the Pearl Bridge. When police investigated the find, a complete human skeleton, along with a purse, a credit card and some clothing, were pulled from the front of what is now known to be a 1973 Chevy pickup. The details on the credit card and the vehicle's license tied the car to Helen Holiday, but it was dental records that confirmed the remains were indeed Helen's. Hood County was now faced with the answer, or at least part of the answer, to a 35-year-old mystery. Authorities said that before the onset of the drought, Helen was submerged for decades, 15 feet below the surface of the lake. When interviewed, Helen's daughter Karen said, It's not a shock, but it is saddening to find out that this is what happened. She explained to Fort Worth newspaper The Star-Telegram, that the night her mother had fled the motorhome, it was in such a desperate rush that she put her hand through the window of the vehicle, leaving bloody marks on the paintwork. She also said that her stepfather had previously, and on numerous occasions, threatened to kill Helen and take her property, but she also said that her mother had very little in the way of income, 
and certainly didn't have enough to leave on her own. Sheriff Roger Deeds, who was head of the investigation, told NBC5 News that due to the state of the remains, the exact cause of Helen's death may never be confirmed. The Rock and Spindle in St Andrews, Scotland is an eroded structure of volcanic rock and stands on the shore at King Kale. In October of 1930, a passerby named John Wilson noticed a small landslide in the hill face on the shore, close to the rock and spindle. On inspection he noticed a square stone structure protruding from the earthen rocks. He left the beach to report his find and soon returned with two other men. Armed with spades, they dug around the stones to reveal a crudely built stone coffin containing skeletal human remains. On October 23, 1930, newspaper The Scotsman revealed the find. In an article entitled Queer St Andrew's Find, they wrote that a professor by the name of Waterston from the St Andrew's University examined the skeleton, and it was his opinion that the remains belonged to a male, and that he had been buried in the hill face at Kinkell for more than 200 years. The skull was said to have no teeth. It was Professor Waterston's opinion that the man had never had teeth, and remarked that such cases were extremely rare. But the most glaringly unusual feature of the skeleton was that the bones below the knees of both legs were gone. The loss of his legs could have been the cause of death, and Professor Waterston surmised that the man may have been a shipwrecked sailor who lost his legs in an accident, or a smuggler who'd had his legs shot or hacked off. The Scotsman's report ends by saying, such theories suggest themselves, but that is all. I could find no further information regarding the mystery man. However, the Scotsman also mentioned that the coffin consisted of two long slabs on each side, two smaller slabs at each end, three slabs covering the top, but no bottom slab. Could it be that the base of the coffin, along with the lower legs and teeth, were simply lost to the elements over time? Due to a drought in the 1950s, a plan was made to create the Richland Chambers Reservoir in Navarro County, Texas, with a pipeline running from Lake Benbrook in Fort Worth, some 120 miles away, in order to bring water to the area. However, due to lack of funding, the project was shelved, and it wasn't until 1979 that the plans were eventually put into action. Construction began in 1982, but before the new Richland Chambers site could be constructed into a functioning water source, the place had to undergo various exhumations of historical graves. Many graves were dug up and moved, but one grave site, with no tombstones, went unnoticed. In 2009, the water at Richland Chambers Reservoir hit a low point, and a hundred feet of previously submerged shoreline was exposed. This was when a cranium and detached jawbone were found by boatmen on the shore of the Chambers Creek section of the lake near Eureka. Those remains were later found to belong to an African American male who was around 40 years of age. But before any formal archaeological investigations could take place, it rained. Water levels rose again, resubmerging the exposed shoreline, and local authorities and historians were made to wait. In 2011, very little rain fell across most of the state during the first six months of the year. During the summer of 2011, the Richland Chambers Reservoir dried up almost completely. In December of that year, a full excavation began, and a post-Civil War era cemetery of freed slaves emerged from the eroded earth. Initially the remains of more than 20 African American people were found mostly children, varying from preterm to nine months old. As the operation continued, five more bodies were uncovered. In total, the remains of 21 children and four adults were unearthed. The remains were thought to be around 100 years old, but after the discovery of square-headed nails, 
which were known to be used in the construction of coffins until the 1880s, it's likely that some of them were even older. It was discovered that the site was part of the unmarked former 19th century Montgomery Hill Cemetery. Analysis of the adult skeletal traits strongly suggested that they were all of African American descent, and through background research, Montgomery Hill Cemetery was found to have been used from roughly 1865 to 1885 to bury African American sharecroppers and their children. The Tarrant County Water District legally owned the water in the lake, but after some negotiations, the Water District agreed to have the bones turned over to the city of Corsicana, which lies a few miles northwest of the reservoir. This happened after a court hearing, which decided that the remains would be reinterred at the Woodland Memorial Park in Corsicana. This is historically an African American gravesite, and it's believed that the people found at the reservoir had relatives buried there. The names and identities of the individuals found at Richland Chambers were never determined, but 1870 census records did offer up several clues about who they might be. No DNA testing was ever planned, as it was deemed too problematic due to the age and condition of the remains. The children's bodies were reinterred on Wednesday, May the 30th, 2012, and the remaining bodies, plus other partial remains, were reinterred the following day. The excavation was hampered when rain began to fall heavily in December of 2011. This continued until January of 2012, and the excavation team found themselves in a race against Mother Nature. In fact, within a day of the final exhumation, rising waters completely resubmerged the site, and the former Montgomery Hill Cemetery was once again underwater. Following storms in spring of 2018, human bones including a skull and what was thought to be timbers of old ships have been washed up on two popular beaches in the county of Kent in England. The bones and timbers found on Sandwich Bay and Margate in May are the result of the storms that hit the southeastern coast of England in April. Most of the finds were washed up inshore from the infamous Goodwin Sands, which lie six miles from the Kent coast, stretch for ten miles, and have been the cause of many shipwrecks over the centuries. As many as 2,000 ships have fallen to these sands, which at lowest tide can lie as little as one foot below the water. The sandbank lies close to major shipping lanes in the area, and it's believed that thousands of lives have gone down with these ships, some dating back to the late 17th century. Notable shipwrecks include the HMS Stirling Castle, taken down in 1703, the SS Montrose in 1914, and the South Goodwin Lightship, which broke free from its anchor moorings during a storm in 1954. As well as these wrecks, there have been historical naval battles in the area, including the Battle of Goodwin Sands in 1652, and the Battle of Dover Strait some 265 years later, in 1917. The seabed is thought to have held these secrets for many years, but the recent storms have disturbed the subaquatic sands, leading to them being exposed and washed ashore. A man by the name of Tony Ovenden, who is a coastal warden, found this femur bone, which measured 43 centimetres in length. Two years ago, shipwreck articles were washed up near the Pegwell end of the beach. Among them were various bone fragments, but no one could be sure if the bones were human. Tony Ovenden explained that he knew right away that the bone he had found on May the 4th, 2018 was a human femur. Then, three weeks later, there was another find. A woman by the name of Margarita Moscoso pulled from the sands the top portion of a skull. She made the discovery while walking her dogs on the beach at Ramsgate. After handing the skull over to a friend, it was then turned into the police, who said that they needed to determine whether or not the skull was in fact human. The remains, although still being examined, are thought to be very old, and the circumstances surrounding their origin are not believed to be suspicious. <laughs> 